There's been some controversy around the FSSP since the recent audience with Pope Francis. Church Militant will cease publication in April after losing defamation lawsuit. Next question. After your last show, many are telling you not to fall for Jordan Peterson. Is Francis the Pope? This comment calls you a recognized and resist guy who won't say it like it is. There are still some wonderful priests who are doing mass in a very conservative manner. Trump's back, and are you gonna vote for him again? Oh boy, here we go. What the heck, all right, let's do this. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Michael Matt. This is The Remnant Underground. Something a little bit different tonight. I wanted to weigh in on the situation with the fraternity of St. Peter and Pope Francis, but my producers tell me that they were literally overwhelmed last week after we kicked off the new From the Mail feature here in the underground. So this week, a little different. Uh, they, want to go, they wanted me to go full on synodal, if you will, down here in the underground and listen to you, which I'm happy to do. So tonight I will be answering some of your questions. Uh, we've selected a few comments from our VIPs who watch us now exclusively at remnant-tv.com. Thank you so much. Uh, you have been, I want to say before we get started, you've been just so supportive as we make this transition away from YouTube. As you know, we're still on YouTube, so we're, we're, we're making the, uh, the proactive decision here to move away from YouTube, especially as we go into this, it's going to be a very strange uh, you know, election year here, obviously, coming up with a lot of big brother crackdowns. So we're moving over now, preempti preemptively, which I think is the right thing to do. And I think already we're up to about 10 million views here at littleremnant-tv.com, which ain't bad. That's a pretty impressive start. Um, and by the way, it's not just the underground content. As we grow and as we expand, we're gonna be adding channels as needed from content creators who are just as sick and tired as, as, as we are here in the underground of being harassed by Big Brother Big Tech. So lots of expansion, expansion projects um, in the offing here uh, that I'm really excited about. So we're off to the races here at rented-tv.com and that is 1000% thanks to you. And we're gonna jump right into your questions tonight. But first, I wanna start with an, a word from tonight's sponsor, which is Charity Mobile. Charity Mobile is America's pro-life phone company. They've got nearly 30 years in the business of helping the unborn. And when you sign up with them, 5% of your monthly plan price goes to the pro-life, pro-family charity of your choice, including the Rundin Foundation, if you'd like. Uh, they've even given us a special offer for you if you make the switch. For a limited time, new customers get a free phone with free activation plus free shipping. There are no contracts. All you need to do is go to charitymobile.com forward slash RTV. That's forward slash RTV. Use the code RTV at checkout. Again, that's charitymobile.com forward slash RTV and use the code RTV at checkout. Okay, now let's get started. Questions from the clans, I guess we could call this. Yeah, right? ready? First yeah. question. Yeah, let's do it. There's been some controversy around the FSSP since the recent audience with Pope Francis. Can you clarify the situation? Yes, yes. Um, where to start with this? I think an observation, and I'm not singling anybody out. Uh, just something I, I noticed when there was a, a private audience between the head of the fraternity of St. Peter and his number one and two and Pope Francis. And something that I noticed was the when this came out, there was a lot of calls for prayers for the fraternity, you know, on YouTube and elsewhere. Uh, Francis is going to shut down the fraternity. Uh, that's the end of the fraternity of St. Peter. And um, I personally never thought that because, and I'll explain why I didn't think that in, in a moment. But I, just to set the context for, from how I'd like to answer this, the next day when the fraternity released a press statement, a statement for the press saying, we had solicited this audience with Pope Francis because we wanted to sort of solidify what we're trying to do and we're trying to get Francis to back us up a little bit more, especially in France, uh, where there are some trouble with, the, with uh, the bishops maybe not being as supportive as they should be, shall we say. And they wanted Francis to sort of say, yeah, this is what your this is your charism, this is what you're here for. They wanted to have that on the record, post traditionalist custodis. And I noticed that then some of the of our people the next day, the tone changed dramatically. And we saw a lot of attacks leveled against the fraternity. Those sellouts, you know, why would they go talk to Pope Francis? Blah, 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 blah. And it was just, it was heartbreaking to me because I remember. 30 years ago, there was a lot of that going on. And I thought that we had overcome that. 
given the situation that we're all we're all in right now. I mean, things are are, are really really bad. Because did any of those predictions at the time come true? Of course not. No, uh, com coming out of that, um, there was this idea that Francis had expressed a preference that they would con celebrate the Fraternity of Saint Peter Priest would con celebrate the new mass on Chrism uh, on Holy Thursday with the, at the with the bishop, you know, at the cathedral or whatever. And people once again freaked out. Oh, this is awful! Look, how dare he do that? And all I could think was, oh man, I must be getting old because that's how it all started. I remember this. I'm sorry, I don't be the old man Mo here, but I remember in 1988, 1989. That's exactly what John Paul said. That's exactly what came out of the Vatican. That the fraternity would have to con celebrate the new mass on some level, at least once a year, to show solidarity with the with the whole liturgical revolution. How many priests do I know who actually did that? And I got to be careful because I don't want to out anybody. But my goodness, I, I know so many of the fraternity guys. My, I mean, <laughs> these guys are, they're on the front line. And see, I can't, you can't come out and tell, I can't quote them to you because that would out them and that would be ridiculous. So you just got to say, guys, read between the lines a little bit. How many fraternity priests, uh, St. Peter priests, do you know who are con celebrating the new mass? These guys are as hardcore traditional Latin mass as can be. You know, I've been walking with these, with these priests, these great young priests for so long, you know, 30 years. I've been talking to them personally. So I'm not sitting on YouTube wondering and speculating about them. I'm talking to these guys up close and personal all the time. And I just feel so sad that people are still waiting for the big betrayal where the fraternity is going to go buy ritual. When is this going to happen? They were telling us it was going to happen 30 years ago. It never happened. And the very, very few priests, fraternity priests, who were more or less ordered by their bishop to come and con celebrate a new mass, chrism mass, and the very, very few that I had ever heard of, even back then, 30 years ago, they stood there, they forgot their stoles, they didn't say anything during the con cell. You know what I mean? Like really clever, kind of funny stuff. And that was the worst of it. I've never even heard in, in the past 25 years, 30 years, I've never even heard of anybody being asked to do that. And you know why? It's because for the most part, the bishops who tend to invite the Paternity of St. Peter into their diocese are more conservative leading, more tradition friendly. I know that that wasn't always the case. It used to be if you had an SSPX chapel, uh, the bishop would say, well, I gotta do something about that SSPX chapel. I'm gonna bring the fraternity in here. There was some examples of that having happened. But I think since the situation has gotten so much worse, and you really do see now the traditional Latin Mass is the salvation, humanly speaking and spiritually speaking, of all of us and of the church, because the church, the Novus Ordo, is absolutely dying without any question about that now. Um, so, 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 so since then, this is not happening because the bishops are more or less sympathetic. I've heard stories, and I know they're true, and I'm not going to say who for obvious reasons, where bishops have actually, you know, come for confirmation or whatever at a fraternity parish. And, you know, I remember recently one, one said, you know, he was public. He said, this is the most beautiful thing. And I feel like God, this is the greatest thing I could have done in my career. This is this is this ranks with the best things I ever did, bringing the fraternity in. He's talking to little kids and, you know, there's packed out church. It makes sense. You know what I'm saying? Bishop Morlino would be a great example of that sort of attitude. Oh, my gosh, this is the faith. This is a revival of the faith. So there are bishops who may not be Archbishop Lefebvre, but they're looking at what the fraternity has brought to their diocese and they're saying, hmm, especially in light of Traditionis Custodis. You see what I'm saying? I think it's very unlikely that too many of these fraternity priests would ever be invited or commanded to come and con celebrate. And if that happens, we'll deal with it then if they have to con celebrate mass once a year, you know, uh, to show something. So I would just say, generally speaking, friends, I mean, the remnant has been at this a long time. I'm not getting any younger. So I remember clearly 30 years ago when this was all the rage, the, the, rage, the Vatican was gonna force the fraternity to come by ritual. Never happened. So attacking the fraternity, we're fools to make war on our brothers in arms, quite frankly. That is so stupid to go after the fraternity of St. Peter. They say, well, what about the SSPX? Attacking the SSPX. We are fools to make war on our brothers in arms. Attacking the SSPX is so stupid right now. This is beyond stupid. And it, what it represents is people who want to say, hey, there's no salvation outside of my parking lot. Where I park my car on Sunday morning, that's the only place where there's salvation. There's an arrogance there. And it's, it's only a few. It's a minority. But sometimes that minority is the most vocal. And what they want to say is, I've made the right decision. All the other decisions are wrong. And as somebody who's been at this since the beginning, and I was confirmed by Archbishop Lefebvre, I've watched this unfold all my life. 
I can tell you that's a really toxic and dangerous position because there are people all over the world who don't have access to the Latin Mass. They don't, they don't have access to the Trinity St. Peter. All they have is an SSPX. You know what I mean? Like, go by, go case by case. Stop making these big, gigantic generalizations. You know, and there is, this is the last thing I'll say about that. There always has been a certain competitiveness between the fraternity and the society, for example. Unite the Clans, by the way, has nothing to do with me uniting the, the fraternity of St. Peter and the Society of St. Paul. Absolutely nothing to do with it. Unite the Clans is something we can actually do, every single one of us, regardless of where you park your car on Sunday morning. And that is all of us are just like, hey, you know what? Anybody who sees the problem in the church today, anybody who's trying to save their, their, their faith, save their souls, save their kids, homeschool, and you got access to a Latin Mass, I don't care if it's fraternity or society or whatever, diocesan, we need to stick together as much as we possibly can. That's basically the, the spirit of the Sharp Pilgrimage. Stick together, lay people. Stick together, clans, family, right? So I think that that what, what, what the, the, the society and the fraternity, there, there are certain questions I would say, don't, don't go up to your fraternity priest and say, hey, Father, I'm thinking about taking the family over to the SSPX. Is that okay? This is just stupid. Don't put them on the spot. There has been this, this, this strategic difference of opinion. And it's the same the other direction. Go to Father Pius X, Father Pius X. Is it okay if we go to the fraternity? Just leave that. You're a grown man. You're a grown woman. Make that decision on your own. Don't be putting these priests on the spot and then run, running back on Facebook. Father just told me I can't go to the fraternity of St. Peter for anything. That's how terrible he is. This is just gossip. It's counterproductive and it's dangerous. Everybody's trying to find the right way right now, the best approach. They're trying to save their souls. Let them do this and stop God bothering and carrying everyone to death because basically what you're promoting is your own personal position on where we should all be going to mass because my opinion matters most. Got to stay away from that. Speaking of God bothering, um, church militants going down. This tweet from Father Jimmy Martin says, church militant will cease publication in April after losing defamation lawsuit. Your thoughts? I, you know, my first, Michael Norris, Church Milton going down, my first comment is no comment. Next question. So I, I want to I wanna, I wanna see if there's anything I'd want to say only for the, you know, for the good of, of people watching this interview. Um, I, I tell you one thing I will say. M one of the things with the Boris Enterprise that struck me early, early on was a reluctance and a hesitancy to unite the clans. And so I will say that. If you notice somebody who's basically saying, I have it all figured out, you must support me, you must give me money, my organization is the only one that's truly doing the Lord's work. If you hear that, turn around 180 and run. Run away from it. Because that is something I've seen many times, not just with Michael Boris, but people who are really, really anti-unite the clans and what that really means, there's a certain desire to become the number one guy. Outside of me now, there's no salvation. You gotta be really careful with that. That said, Michael Voris has got his own, <clears throat> his own demons. I saw them a long time ago. I pray for him. He says he's trying to reform his life. I certainly hope he is. I think the people who are now piling on, you know, they were with him all along. And now that he's in trouble and now that his church militant is shutting down, they're piling on. Um, I think this is reprehensible and disgusting. I will have no part in it. I think we should pray for our, our people who like that who have fallen. I think you should also, you know, what we were trying to say with, with respect to that organization was, you know, they're not really even claiming to be traditionalists. That's why we moved away a long, long, long time ago. So I would say just be careful. Like, like don't write checks to organizations that aren't fully tested. I think the traditional movement, the Catholic movement needs to be much more discerning on who you get behind and how fast you get behind and the lack of vetting and the lack of testing that sometimes goes on. Not, not everybody who says, hey, I say Hail Mary's on, on YouTube. How about me? I'm really awesome. That's not, the, that's not always the case. You know what I mean? So I would say just use this example to be a little bit more discerning. And again, I think ugh, piling on and attacking people who fall like this uh, is really gross. Really, I think it's, uh, it's, it's just untoward and, and, shouldn't, and shouldn't be done. Uh, and the same, the same token, I think, again, be more discerning on who you, who you select to be your leader. Fair enough. Uh, next question. After your last show, many are telling you, oh, so many comments, telling you not to fall for Jordan Peterson. Will you clarify? Not to fall for Jordan Don't Peterson. Don't fall for Jordan Peterson. 
oh boy, I don't know how many more times I can say that I can explain that because the same thing happens every time I quote Joe Joe Rogan. He says the f bomb. How could you do that? He's not a traditional Catholic. Okay. Bill Maher. Bill Maher. Elon Musk. Elon Musk. Uh, even to some extent, Tucker Carlson. Uh, certainly now, um, Russell Brand is another one, and now not Jordan Peterson. Uh, guys, we're we're looking for. You know, we we always talk about what we get from Sister Lucia Fatima, the diabolical disorientation that affects all of us. First thing you do is you be wide open to the possibility that you too, to some degree, are diabolically disoriented. Don't be so convinced you're not, because that's the problem. Even the elect will be deceived, right? This is what we, this is what we know to be true from scripture. So we all, to some extent, have to fend off the diabolical disorientation of the day. So when I look at a guy like Jordan Peterson, or I see a guy like Russell Brand seeming to make, um, uh, it advances in the right direction. It's, it, it's, 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 it's encouraging to me because those people, the, the, the turnaround that they're making shows and demonstrates for all of us that this whole vaunted New World Order thing in the world or the Novus Ordo Church and, you know, that we've got going on since Vatican II is simply not working. So you have people making progress, trying to find the truth. And for traditional Catholics to say, well, until you're all the way a Latin mass daily communicant guy, you are anathema. Makes no sense on the one hand. It's totally uncharitable. Uh, I think what we should be doing with Jordan Peterson, Russell Brand, Tucker Carlson is saying, guys, keep coming. Keep coming. Okay, what you're looking for, you don't know it yet, but what you're looking for is the social kingship of Jesus Christ. And traditional Catholics have to stand up and be proud of that. It's not the Constitution. It's not Thomas Jefferson. It's not even just the Latin Mass, right, which is the touchstone of the traditional Catholic counter-revolution. It is the social kingship of Jesus Christ that's missing. That's why we have this chaos. Nobody's proclaiming it. I saw a bishop the other day who, <laughs> rather than talking about the necessity and what's happening right now with the, our country falling apart, southern border, uh, southern border you know, disappearing, uh, chaos everywhere. He's citing Thomas Jefferson, you know, who was who was a deist, who was, used an exacto knife to, to hack up the pages of the Bible he didn't like and thought Jesus Christ was just a nice guy, but not God. You know, he's apostles sitting on the whole deposit of faith, but he's like Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, baby. Fathers. It's because we lack confidence in the actual Catholic solution because it's been so drummed out of out of us and so vilified in the world. But that's what's needed. So what we need to do and what we are going to do on the TV and we have been doing, we're going to continue to do, look at Jordan Peterson and say, it's the kingship of Christ. It's the kingship of Christ. It's the kingship of Christ that you're missing. We don't want to be out there competing with Tucker Carlson who does fantastic work on the political front, to some degree the culture front. What we need to do, somebody has to do, because the bishops for the most part aren't, we have to bring the ultimate Catholic solution, which is the social reign of Jesus Christ, to all of these men's attention. And say, here it is. This is what you're looking for. You don't know it, but you are. Russell, Russell, buddy, this is what you're actually looking for, right? So I think in order to do that, we can't burn bridges before people even get to them. We have to be trying to love them into the, into the light, if you will. And I think that with Remnant TV, our audience is comprised mostly of adults. When I When I cite a Rus Russell Brand or, a, or a Professor Jordan Peterson, I'm not advising that you take him on as your spiritual director. There's plenty of things I disagree with all these guys. But I think it is important to consider what they're saying. The dissatisfaction with the system as it is, is something that traditional Catholics need to seize upon and strategize about. And so that's all it's ever been, really. I feel like when you quote them too, it's a bit of vindication because somebody from that world that we've already rejected or whatever, they, they're starting to come around, and that means that we're on the side of truth. Of course. And they're starting to find that of piece course. by piece. And it, it also just it sort of hits different when someone from their camp starts turning on. Absolutely, and, the le and it freaks the left out. So I think it's very important to try, for us as traditional Catholics to try to sort of recruit the Jordan Petersons. Don't alienate them. Don't attack them because they don't, they don't have everything right yet. And hopefully they continue to come in the right direction. And then we can use their influence. Right now, I use Jordan Peterson just this past week, who full on attack, uh, and, and in a charitable way, I mean, just a truthful way, attacked Pope Francis, who he said is trying to save the planet, not trying to save souls. Do you realize how significant that is? Mm -hmm. Jordan Peterson is one of the most uh, influential sort of cultural thinkers in the world today. For him to say Francis is trying to save the planet, and he's not trying to save souls, he's lost the plot, how do you think that resonates in the Vatican? Yeah. 
when they find out that that's what's happening. That's why we promoted it, so the Vatican would find out. This is what they're saying about you, not because we totally agree with Jordan Peterson, but because he's a cultural icon, a, a, a thinker, an academic that everybody sort of recognizes and respects or hates, and he's got the exact same position vis-a-vis -vis Francis and climate change and all that, that I do. Well, you see what's happening? The power of opposition is getting stronger and getting gaining momentum by recruiting that without saying, I think that Jordan Peterson is a saint and we should be just like him. I hope he, you know, right. is Quoting my Quoting something director. that he said that's true is not a blanket endorsement. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So that's why we do that. Okay. So this is probably still our most common comment. Something like, yeah, but I don't care anymore because Francis isn't the Pope. This comment calls you a recognized and resist guy who won't say it like it is. So do you agree with this? Is Francis the Pope? I certainly agree with recognize and resist because that's what all the great saints of history did. That's what Robert Bellarmine called for. And he, that's what Catherine of Siena did. She was a re recognized and resister. So yeah, I got no problem with that. They, they think they're insulting me with them. Like, guilty as charged. Um, Francis is not the Pope. Okay, well, we're adults. We can all have this discussion. I think it is possible, obviously, that a pope could uh, become so egregious in his error that he ceases to be pope. I mean, that my, that's just logic that would, would bring me there. Uh, someone like the great Bishop Schneider doesn't allow the, that doesn't doesn't consider that God will ever allow that to, to get that bad that that it will happen. And I love Bishop Schneider and his faith. Uh, in believing that God is going to intervene. I think that's a beautiful model to follow. Uh, we just don't really know right now. So then you go, okay, well, you got Bishop Schneider and you got Cardinal Burke and you've got Mueller and a lot of people out there who are saying he must be resisted. I mean, Mueller called what he's doing with his synodal way. He called it a hostile takeover of the church. That's recognizing and resistant, isn't it? So you get behind him, and that, that sort of prelate or, or prince of the church, in resisting. And then making the final call, is that my, my call to finally say that Francis isn't the Pope? Boy, that's taken a lot for, you know, just a, a layman who I, you know, I'm not a priest, I'm not a bishop. Um, can I make that call? And would it matter if you did? And, and that's, that's the, the, the thing. With me, I don't, maybe it's because I was a political science major and not a theology major. Because for me, it's a matter of strategy. You know, what, what's the best way to defend the faith of our fathers, the traditions of our church, the Latin mass, is it to run out there and lead with he's not the Pope, Francis isn't the Pope? Because as soon as I say that, you got, you got millions of people are just like, huh? He, he, he lives in the Vatican, he wears white, the whole world, a couple billion Catholics consider him the Pope. And Michael, Matt, you say he's not? Exactly, when do you get over yourself? You know what I mean? Like we, we alienate so many people with that. I don't care about alienating people, but I do care about strategically uh, damaging the cause. So like I've said so many times before, Francis looks at, at me or somebody in the tratty side of the thing over on YouTube saying, he's not the Pope because I say it like it is, right? And Francis just listens patiently to that. And then he turns to the world and he says, do you have a Pope? And the world says, yeah. And he says, who's the Pope? And the world says, you are Francis. And then he looks at all the tragedies and goes, I rest my case, have a nice day. Mm -hmm. And where are we then? Talking to our mom, you know, talking to the mailman about it, nobody cares. What have we accomplished by doing this? You know what I mean? So I, I don't so much think I need to denounce state of accountism. I don't, I never have. You know, we have, we've had our disagreements, but I don't come out here every week and say, well, today I'm just gonna take a shot at Sadie's because it divides the clans. And I don't blame state of accountants for being scandalized to such an extent that they think, well, if this guy's the Pope, the gates of hell have prevailed. I get that argument. I just personally believe that it's, 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 it's strategically more sound to fall in with the, the camp that says God will solve this in his good time. It's not for me to save the church. God's going to save his church. And in the meantime, I just have to do the same things I would do, whether it's Pius X on the throne or Francis on the, on the throne. What is that? I got to know, love, and serve God in this world so I can be happy with him forever in the next. And anything that anybody does, including the Pope, that stands in the way of that must be resisted. And I will take my chances with God in terms of, oh, you can't resist the Pope. Really? Well, Dante did. Michelangelo did. Catherine of Siena did. Uh, Robert Bellarmine did. You know what I mean? Like, there's all sorts of things that we can, we can factor into that discussion that I simply am not worried about that first and foremost. Francis is, in my opinion, right now, I would have to say the worst Pope in the history of the papacy. 
And, and, and then I think that the faith has to come first. So we got to resist his agenda. But making that dramatic proclamation that I, Michael Matt, know for absolute sure he's not the Pope, well, I think that would make Francis very happy. Do you know what I mean? I think he would love it if that's what we did. We spent all of our time trying to do that, an argument which we are going to lose merely on the grounds of what the man is wearing, the white. <laughs> he wins. And I don't like that. So no, it's, it's not my thing. All right. So the next comment says, please don't forget about those of us who are traditionalists but have no place to go except Nervous Order Masses. Also, there are still some wonderful priests who are doing Mass in a very conservative manner. What's your response? Oh, Stays wow. Back. Yeah. No, that's... I hope that people have been watching our show and watching, reading our newspaper and you know, following us for a long time um, understand how that is so near and dear to my heart. You know, and it's some, some of the radical, you know, rad trad friends of mine think that I'm too soft and I don't even care. I do not care if people say, well, Michael, Matt's too friendly with, I mean, we have Protestants in our, in our audience who, who I'm happy to talk with and I enjoy talking to. That, you know, you get kind of tired after a while of just talking to a group of people and everyone's nodding at you, don't you? That's really boring stuff. You're not making any headway. You're just preaching to the choir, right? So if I'm willing to talk to Protestants, which I certainly am and do all the time, I just spent a whole weekend talking to a Protestant and it was a wonderful weekend. I got to say it, maybe do a show on that, about apologetics, you know? Um, and we, lo we love each other. We're, we're, we're still, you know, trying to figure it all out. So um, if I can say that about Protestants, I absolutely, I think we are all called. I'm not saying I'm virtuous. I'm saying I think all Catholics are called before God to be charitable toward every, everyone right now who's trying to figure out what to do. People are losing their kids, they're losing their families, they're losing their faith, and now they're losing their countries. It's chaos, you know? And so if the traditional Catholic position is to anathematize everybody who's not here yet, I want no part of that. And if it means that after 35 years of being a traditional Catholic, I have to drop the qualifier traditional Catholic, I will do it in a heartbeat. You know what I mean? If that's what's gonna, that's what's that's what we're gonna become known for. This horrible bunch of uh, sanctimonious Karens who are out there saying that everybody who doesn't see the light yet is the spawn of Satan or nothing. So of course not. So we have many tradition, many tradition-minded Catholics who read our newspaper, who watch our show. And I think, I hope, pray to God that I've gotten through to them that this is, I'm not, this is, we're all in this together. That's what Uniting the Clans is all about. I don't go to the Novus Ordo Mass and I never will. Right? So I'm taking my stand. But somebody who lives out in you know, Tubuc, Timbuktu has no access to the Latin Mass. And he has like a Father Michelli. Vincent Michelli is a good example for me, uh, the old Jesuit who was at Christendom College when I was out there. And early on in his career, when I first got to know him, he was a friend of my father's, he said only, only the Novus Ordo Mass, because that's the way it was at that point. And at the end of his life, he said the traditional Latin Mass exclusively. But I can tell you this, this, this uh, uh, Italian... Uh, Jesuit two-fisted priest um, who was saying a new mass when I first knew him when I was 20 years old or whatever had a huge impact especially on the guys at, at Christendom College you know um, yet he was saying the new mass what do you do with this you know why because he was a traditionalist at heart and he was doing the right thing and he was he didn't like the new mass but that's where he was at that point he said it as traditionally as he possibly could he was moving in the direction of tradition and I guess that's how I would answer the question uh, and generally speaking, um, what direction are they moving in? You know, I, uh, I, I'm not going to name this priest, but I, I happened to see a diocesan priest talking to somebody else and uh, to a young person who was asking evidently about where to go to Mass and could she go to the SSPX or whatever. And I suddenly see him turn towards everybody who's waiting out in the hall and he goes, you want to go to the SSPX? That's just fine with me. Well, I, you heard it here first. That war is over. And if that's if you don't have any access to the traditional mass of Trinity St. Peter, the Dias, you want to go to the SSPX? Go for it. I give you my blessing. You know what I mean? So the, mm -hmm. a huge and added, he's diocesan, he's also diocesan. by ritual. Yes, right? exactly. By ritual, uh, diocesan priest. Mm -hmm. But I think those guys, those priests, are on the front line. You know, they're the ones who are really fighting hard. And I, I have many, many. I'm, I'm, I'm blessed and graced to call uh, to, to count among my friends. I don't look down on them, and I know, and I won't go to the Novus Ordo Mass either. And they know I won't, and I won't. But we're all in this together, and they're moving in the direction of tradition. It's just a matter of charity. I think it's basic charity. Don't denounce, don't condemn, don't anathematize people who aren't fully in, on board yet. Very good. All right, this is going to change the subject quite a bit. Okay, here's one that says, Trump's back on the Colorado ballot. 
You supported him in 2020. Is 2024 a bigger deal? And are you going to vote for him again? Well, this this almost goes back to what we talked about earlier with uh, Joe Rogan and some of these, you know, Russell Brand types. I mean, with with Donald Trump, I always expected that people would anticipate because we were right out of the gate. We supported Trump. Why? Because he wasn't one of the swamp creatures. Was he a saint? Daily communicate? No, 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 no. He wasn't. Was he a traditional? No, he wasn't a traditional guy. Is he Christian? Probably. Hard to say. You know. But you could see he was going to disrupt the system. So early on, 2016, of course, we supported him because we're always looking for opportunities to buy time. But then for some people who are very still two-party and they're still believing in this whole American thing, you know, the whole the, the, the democracy thing, which, of course, is a joke. We haven't had democracy in a long time, as what happened in 2020 proved definitively with respect to Donald Trump. But for them, they think that then it's a it's a it's an endorsement of Donald Trump as the savior of the of the world, and that's gonna that's gonna, and that Michael Matt is being deceived. He's being sucked in by this charlatan, this politician. You know, it's just so stupid. It's so stupid. But the thing is, like, I stopped voting. I didn't vote for Bob Dole. I wouldn't vote for Mitt Romney if he gave me a million dollars. That, that that's just a joke. George W. Bush was a neocon joke, right? So I voted for Trump. Because I thought, well, he's going to come in and throw a few rocks around, throw a few bombs around and disrupt everything, which is exactly what he did. Um, yes, I will vote for him as a matter of self-defense because I think he will be less likely to come and eat my children and hunt down my family and crush the church. Okay. And be, Maybe a little more freedom. <laughs> Maybe a tiny bit more like freedom. That. Yeah. Distraction, definitely. Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, how can people interact with you outside of your video content? Like come see me for a cup of coffee whenever they want. I don't know if you want to put that invite out there. Oh, right. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, the Remnant, uh, we have a lot of new subscribers. We've got a lot of viewers, I guess I would say, that, that don't know a whole lot about the Remnant, I suppose. Um, the, so the paper itself has been going for 57 years, almost 60 years. Um, so I would say subscribe to the paper for sure, because that's how, no matter what happens with big tech, that's how we can stay in touch. And this, I don't think it's going anywhere. I don't think the... The, uh, the, the, the the big tech big brother folks have a whole lot of interest in an old newsprint newspapers with holy pictures on the cover and that can't be monitored. So I think that that's this will be around for a long time still, which is why we've uh, dug in and it's a money hole, but we've dug in on keeping it alive because we have to be able to keep the clans you know more or less united and informed after they turn the lights off, after they turn the, the internet off, which I think is going to come eventually. So the newspaper is a great way to do it. Uh, Remnant Tours is a huge part of our apostolate. You know, we're getting ready to go once again for the 32nd time or whatever. Back to Chartres for the pilgrimage from Paris to Chartres, which is a huge opportunity for the clans to meet and to, you know, to, to be confirmed, to sustain each other, to strategize, to plan for the future. Everything I said to today, tonight, about strategy, a lot of I've seen that in action over 30 years in the Chartres pilgrimage, where you see so many people. They don't all agree with each other. They're not all traditional Catholics but they're all trying to figure it out and they're all walking together and they've made a huge statement, not only for the ch in defense of the church and of traditional Latin mass, but also politically in France. So that's a big part of our apostolate, Remnant Tours. Uh, the Remnant Foundation, we have a, a really exciting project coming up here in a few months um, that I'm gonna announce hopefully next week mm -hmm. about going to Africa and doing a major, very public um, display of support and solidarity with the African bishops and uh, the traditional Catholic movement in Africa, which a lot of people don't know much about. But our foundation is the way we're going to be able to fund that. We're going to have people donating to our foundation so that we can give money to um, the mission in, in Africa. So Remnant Foundation is tax exempt. Too. Yes, right, exactly. Charity. The foundation is a charity, it's, ta it's tax exempt for different purposes. We use it for different things, including sending young people to France, uh, which has really changed a lot of people's lives, a lot of young people's lives, finding out what traditionalism actually looks like, that microcosm of Christendom actually looks like mm -hmm. when you have 30 different countries, 30 different languages, you I'm know, a convert. you yourself, yeah, yeah. Shark Pilgrim. So that's been a huge uh, benefit, I think, and a success. And the foundation helps us to do that, to finance that sort of thing. And then remnantnewspaper.com. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I mean, we update remnantnewspaper.com probably three, four, five times a day. I don't know, it depends on the day. Sure. But, but in other words, we're, there's, there's a lot of content there. If you think it's just the, the Sunday night show on Remnant TV, um, we do a whole lot of stuff. We have some really great writers from all over the world. So make sure you visit remnantnewspaper.com every day. And if they want to meet you in person, the CIC is a good place to do it. Yeah, I get around a little bit for speaking. There's so much going on here that I don't, don't accept as many invitations as I probably would like to, um, to speak, to come places to speak. Um, but the... 
the big time where we can all get together is definitely the Catholic Identity Conference. We hold it in Pittsburgh every year at the end of September, first part of October. This is three days where we get to get together with human beings. Mm -hmm. There's no AI. You're not staring at a screen all weekend. You get to eat lunch and have dinner and have a drink or two mm -hmm. with a human being, have human contact, which incredibly is becoming something of a conservative uh, mm -hmm. uh, principle or ideal. So yeah, the, the CIC is great. I, I am see that thing, which is fun because it allows me to meet so many people. I'm sitting at the front. I'm not just giving a talk and then disappearing up to my hotel room for, for the rest of the conference. Uh, it's a lot of work, but it's really worth it. I'll, I stay up in the front of that room and we get to meet hundreds. There's usually seven or 800 people at the conference. So if you come to the CIC, you can sign up for it right now. In fact, um, guaranteed that we'll have a chance to get to know each other a little bit. And that's how the, the clans, uh, another way that the clans get together uh, exchange information, contact information, you know, I get to find out what you're Network. doing. Yeah, what's your parish, is, what you're doing with your parish, what you're doing with your home school, whatever your apostle it is, or if it's just another family. We're always trying to find families that we can unite with. So CIC is a very important weekend where the clans get together and humanly uh, uh, interact and exchange with each other. CIC and the Sharp Pilgrimage are the two great opportunities, I think, to do that. So that's, that's, about, that's about it, other than every week we try to do this... Uh, Remnant TV, the underground program. And then again, as I said at the top of the show, we're starting to expand uh, that as well to offer more content at Remnant TV as well. That was my last question. All right, friends. Well, that's that's it for tonight. Thank you very much for listening. And if you want to get involved with this, I don't think we're going to do an exclusive uh, question and answer type interview like this very often, but we will try to do one or two questions per episode if possible. So if you want to do that, Follow me on Twitter and also leave us a comment over at remnant-tv.com and specify you'd like to have this address on, at, the, at the Remnant Underground. I'll do my best to, to answer it and to involve you more uh, in our show here at Remnant TV. Thank you very much. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.